Hi, my name is Ben Stieber, and I'm making this video to explain my hypothesis, or conjecture if you really have doubts, on how the dark matter phenomenon may be explained. This is a very big problem that scientists have been puzzling over for 80 years. Finding out the answer to this question will reveal how every galaxy, including our own, formed and how the universe as we know it came into being. The problem is this. Galaxies spin too fast to stick together. If you add up all the normal matter in a galaxy, the gas, dust, rocks, moons, planets, and stars, even the potential black holes, there is still not enough mass to produce the gravity needed to keep the galaxy together at the rate at which it spins. More strange is how the galaxies spin. As Vera Rubin's research on the Andromeda galaxy clearly shows, its rotation reaches maximum and does not appear to change greatly at further distances from the galaxy's center. We would expect the spinning of the galaxy to slow down the further we measure from the galactic center, but we don't see that. Furthermore, galaxies form in clusters, and these clusters too do not have the mass needed to produce the gravity which would bind them together in each other's orbits. This means that the majority of gravity in the universe cannot be accounted for using normal matter alone. Most of the gravity in the universe is produced by something else. Scientists could have named this something else anything they wanted. The name given it by Fritz Zwicky and adopted by physicists was dark matter. It should be noted that this is not just a name. It is a concept. It is a concept that there is matter that we have never seen and don't know anything about. The idea is that for all the normal stuff we see in the universe producing gravity, there is about five or six times the stuff we don't see that is producing it. This stuff we don't see fills space where it is needed to hold the galaxies together. So, if dark matter exists, then it combined with the normal matter may provide enough gravity to hold all the galaxies and clusters together. But what if dark matter doesn't exist? Many scientists today don't even want to entertain the idea that dark matter does not exist. However, since we've never detected it directly, and since we have no room left for dark matter in the standard model of physics, the question should at least be raised. If dark matter does not exist, then what could be keeping the galaxies and galactic clusters together? Well, we know it's gravity at least. So let's look at the history and the math of gravity. The official scientific study of gravity begins with Galileo challenging the Ptolemaic model of the universe. Through a strange philosophical synergy, the Catholic Church, which was the central political and cultural force in Europe in the 15 and 1600s, had largely adopted Aristotelian philosophy as science. This included his universal model. The universe in their concept was geocentric, a series of spheres centered around planet Earth. However, observations of the inner planets clash with Aristotelian design, so Ptolemy made changes to these orbits to maintain the geocentric arrangements. Adopting Aristotelian science also meant that there should be a relationship to the nature of an object, if it were glass, metal, or wood, for example, and how fast it would fall to Earth. Aristotle believed that heavier objects would fall proportionately faster than lighter objects. Being that these two ideas were now tenets of the faith of the Holy Catholic Church, it was assumed that to believe otherwise would be heretical on both counts. Galileo, being no more than curious and brave, stepped into that heresy first by suggesting a thought experiment in which two objects of different nature dropped from the same height would fall at the same rate. This flew in the face of Aristotelian design, but did not challenge the power structure of the church's authority, so Galileo's idea could be largely brushed aside. That is until Galileo would argue in favor of the Copernican model of the universe which quite explicitly destroyed the church's identity of infallibility and upended its claim to divine authority. Nicholas Copernicus had collected data from observing planets and stars 
that indicated the Earth was not the center of the universe, that the Earth and all other bodies known revolve around the Sun, the heliocentric model. The full manuscript of his findings was published very close to his death. Controversial for its day, the impact was softened by its dedication to Pope Paul III. It also indicated that the book was to be taken as a mathematical, not a physical study. Just numbers, not reality. Nevertheless, the effects of the findings would represent a lasting challenge to papal authority, despite this dedication. Galileo had read these Copernican ideas and found confirmation in the planets using telescopes. The Ptolemaic geocentric model could not account for ever seeing all of the phases of the planet Venus. The Aristotelian model could, but Venus could only be full if it and the Sun were in opposite positions in the sky, which they never are. Thus, seeing all the phases of Venus could confirm or refute the claim. Through careful study, Galileo did indeed see all of the phases, and he would make this discovery public. This led to his trial in 1633 and lifelong house arrest under suspicion of heresy. He would die under lock and key by order of the Catholic Church, to which he remained loyal to his dying day. Galileo's two heretical crimes against the Church, however, did manage to prevail in the long run. They pronounced the authority of scientific reason using direct experimental confirmation, such as would shape all future research on the force which holds the planets and moons and stars together. Which brings us to the next major researcher in the force of gravity, Johann Kepler. Kepler was working with Danish nobleman, astronomer, and absurd mustache owner Tycho Brahe on the subject of the retrograde motions of Mars and why it was so extreme across the background stars while other retrograde planetary motions were so slight. Planets in the night sky will appear to move backwards in their orbits from time to time. For a while, no one knew why. Kepler was a contemporary of Galileo, so the heliocentric versus the geocentric models were still hotly debated at the time. Kepler was an affirmed heliocentrist who avoided Catholic persecution completely because he was Protestant. He formed the hypothesis that because all the planets move around the sun, this backward motion, called retrograde motion, is caused by changing the angle at which a planet is viewed as they pass the Earth. However, this did not explain how the degree to which the retrograde motions seen were very different. If the orbits were circular, and the distance between them unchanging, as was assumed, then the retrograde motion should be proportional. Yet all of the planets, and Mars in particular, had very different retrograde motions. Kepler did some amazing work, in which he established three laws for orbiting bodies. First, that a planet moves around the Sun in an ellipse, with the Sun placed at one of its foci. Second, that a line drawn from a planet in orbit to the Sun would trace out an equal area of that ellipse for an equal amount of time. Third, that the square of the orbital period would be proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. So, for a while, astronomers knew how the planets moved and could predict their motions, but had no idea why. Fortunately, one of the greatest geniuses of all time decided to take a shot at it. His name, of course, was Isaac Newton. Newton began work on his own in binomial theorem that would lead him to develop calculus. This would prove to be the most important mathematical development in centuries. The capabilities of calculus were unlimited in describing the universe in strict numerical terms. Newton's discoveries were not limited to mathematics alone, but also their application. He devised in simplest terms the three laws of motion. The first, of inertia, that objects will maintain their velocities until acted upon by a force. The second, that a force will equal the product of the mass times the acceleration. The third, of all forces acting as pairs, which are equal and opposite. This is very important because Newton resolved that all interaction between masses can be defined by forces. Some forces are applied by contact, and other forces, like gravity, may operate at a distance. Newton could not work out the physical mechanism of this action at a distance, but he could analyze its effects. Which brings us to the apple. 
Newton could not understand how this action at a distance of gravity could not induce the moon to fall to the earth. Supposedly, while pondering this, he saw an apple fall to the ground. Some say the apple hit him in the head, but wherever it landed, he then imagined throwing the apple a bit further away. He could then imagine throwing it further and further until he realized that he could, at some point, throw the apple so hard that the curve of its motion would match the curve of the earth. The apple would be in orbit, just like the moon. It would never hit the ground. Knowing this, he could graph the paths of the planets, provide a geometric proof of Kepler's laws, and he could apply the concept of action at a distance using his calculus. Newton was able to calculate gravity as a force. This force of action at a distance between two bodies is equal to the product of the masses and a natural constant of gravity, and is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. This calculation would be the foundation of all that mankind knew about gravity for more than two centuries. Then, in the late 1800s, light started leaving physicists in the dark. It was discovered that the velocity of light is constant regardless of how the observer moves relative to the light source or vice versa. Classical mechanics had no means of explaining this phenomenon. It is counterintuitive to think that anyone can move any way they like and still see the same speed of light from every direction and off of every object regardless of how that object moved. While the mechanics of this phenomenon could not be explained, the mathematics of it could be worked out. Henrik Anton Lorentz calculated a coordinate system that could measure the differences of times and places to accommodate for the constant speed of light. This is originally thought to be a correction rather than a formulation. It is here in the story of gravity that we come across Albert Einstein, who in 1905 writes a paper not only defending the Lorentz transformation, but issuing that all of physics should be upended to install it as absolute theory. In Newtonian mechanics, all space and time are unified, and everyone observes the same things at the same times in all places. No frames of reference are wrong, and none of them disagree. However, to accommodate the new understanding of light, Einstein presented a new way of looking at things where different observers would see different events at different times and places, depending on their motion. Thus, several frames of reference would disagree, yet none of them would be wrong. The idea was revolutionary, and it gave birth to a new branch of physics that would be sculpted almost entirely by Albert Einstein and his principles, relativity. In this case of moving bodies, it is known as special relativity. At this point, relativity has already once changed Newton's model of the universe, and it immediately threatened to do so again. For the question was presented that the path of a light beam could be bent by accelerating the light source. The light would travel on a curved path relative to its own reference frame as its coordinates change. Anyone watching the light beam and traveling along with it would also be accelerated and would thus experience a force according to F equals MA. However, there is nothing to distinguish a locally accelerated force from a gravitational force. Either formula can solve for F so gravity equations should give the same results as acceleration equations. The problem is the mass of the objects in each case. To solve for any force, be it in gravity or acceleration, the objects experiencing the force must have mass. Light particles, photons, have no mass. Newton's equations drop to zero. Einstein had to invent an entirely new set of equations with an entirely new set of rules. He had no choice but to re-examine the most modern known nature of reality and to completely reinvent gravitation from Newton's obsolete equation. He called this undertaking the general theory of relativity. Now, you may remember that Einstein staked the claims of his special relativity not on his own mathematics, but of the Lorentz transformation. Einstein, though he was capable of formulating revolutionary ideas and equations, had a way not of groundbreaking new concepts entirely on his own, but of applying existing theory in groundbreaking new ways. His general theory is no exception. Although it took him ten years to formulate it, this general theory of relativity had been established by the mathematics of physicists and mathematicians such as Ricci Corbastro, Raymond, Christoffel, Gauss, and his own professor Minkowski. 
Einstein collected the mathematical concepts needed and then simply set his terms equal to zero in flat space. That done, all he has to do is place the space-time values on one side of the equation and the mass values on the other. It's basically the same idea as setting a scale to zero before weighing something, except he's going a step further by actually building the scale himself. Thus was formed the Einstein field equations. This single short line contains all of the objects and variables needed to calculate any gravitational field is curved space-time. The equations break down like this. R mu nu is the Ricci tensor. It is a trace of the Riemann tensor, which imagines a constant vector pointing in one linear direction that moves parallel to itself on a closed path. If the space is flat or has a total curvature of zero, then when it completes the path, the vector will point in the same direction because it returns to its start point in flat space. But if the space is curved, the vector will change its direction. If the field is positively curved, like a cone, then at path's end, the vector will have changed in a direction away from its path of motion because the path that it is traveling on is shorter, so it cannot return to its same start point in flat space. If the path is negatively curved, like a saddle, the vector will change in the direction towards its path of motion because the path it is traveling on is longer and it overshoots its start point in flat space. While sounding like a simple concept, the mathematics which describe this are quite complex. It should also be said that the Ricci tensor has no influence on the geometry of the space. You can define where and in what parameters it operates, but that's it. The next term includes r and g mu nu and is divided by 2 for algebraic reasons. r is the Ricci curvature scalar. It is an object which imagines a sphere in spacetime and indicates how the sphere changes when the spacetime curves. Please note that the curvature scalar, like the tensor, is describing the space assigned to it. This brings us to the central object of general relativity, g mu nu, the metric tensor or simply the metric. The metric is a mathematical definition of spacetime. It is the numerical representation of Newton's gravitational field. Any gravitating object can be defined by the metric. While the previous objects of the Ricci tensor and scalar offer descriptions of the spacetime, the metric provides the definition of the spacetime being described. There is one rule that the metric tensor has to obey. The metric tensor must be made up of real numbers. Real numbers are any number not multiplied by little i. Little i stands for imaginary. You get little i by taking the square root of a negative number. Because you can only get positive numbers when you square them, then the square root can only be made of positive numbers. You can only imagine taking the square root of a negative number. They aren't real, hence imaginary. The next term is a bit controversial. It has been in and out of the Einstein field equations for a number of physicists, Einstein included. I personally have more doubt than confidence in it, but it is there, and I'd best recognize it. Lambda g mu nu is the metric times lambda, the cosmological constant, which is a slight change to the metric which has an impact over extremely long distances. Not stellar long, not galactic long, but universe long. It proposes that the metric is actually offset by a Lilliputian amount which changes the behavior of space-time over these distances. For many cosmologists, it is responsible for the universal expansion and thus holds the key to understanding the Big Bang and dark energy. Equals! One half of the equation's done! Let's get to the other side. In this term, we see the stress energy tensor, denoted by T mu nu. The idea is that the more mass there is in one coordinate, the higher will be the energy density and the pressure at that coordinate. More so, how the mass is interacting with its surroundings and itself Properties like energy flux, momentum, and shear can also be calculated. This provides all the relevant properties of mass without including mass itself. Multiplied by 8 pi g divided by c to the fourth, governed by Newton's gravitational constant. This gives the entire equation in elegant simplicity. The Einstein field equations presented in 1915 have never been refuted and define everything we claim to know about gravity. For the most part, anyhow. But then dark matter comes into play. Where is the extra matter? Or even more mysterious, where is the extra pressure and energy? Because remember that the Einstein field equations do not incorporate mass and thus matter into them. Just the descriptions of mass, energy, flux, 
pressure, momentum, and shear are all part of the Einstein field equations as the causes for more gravity. So where are all the extra components in the galaxies? Could it be that dark matter can demonstrate gravity without any of these classic Newtonian components and thus without needing to bend to Einstein's equations at all? What is it that we can't see it, can't see its Newtonian effects, and can't test it? Some scientists have tried to reject dark matter and have built a school of thought called Modified Newtonian Dynamics, or MOND, which is trying to redefine gravity in altered Newtonian terms. However, if you recall, Newton's gravity is superseded by Einstein's, so why not modify his equations? Why go back to Newton? Einstein's equations are locked. All of the terms balance out, and there's no room for anything more without splitting it between both sides and thus canceling it out. Newton's gravity provides the only potential back door around this problem. There may still be room in Newton's gravity to adjust the numbers and explain the strange behavior. Still, Newton's gravity is far behind the times as classical terms prove incompatible with relativistic principles. Which brings the story up to me and my hypothesis. With nothing much to really go on, about eight years ago I undertook my own adventure in finding a solution to the problem. The potential solution I came back with is the non-singular model of the black hole. To introduce my hypothesis, let's start off with what is a black hole. Well, Einstein's equations indicate that gravity will increase with, among other things, pressure. So the more pressure, the more gravity. And of course, pressure can also be related to density. Pressure can increase, and thus gravity increase with it, increasing pressure in a positive feedback loop. This will continue until the pressure is so great that the gravity cannot compress it any further. The collapse stops, and an equilibrium between the pressure and gravity is established. This may form a rocky planet like Earth or a gas giant like Jupiter. Sometimes the gravity and pressure and density are so great that it can force nuclear reactions to occur in the core of the object. And if these reactions can be sustained, the whole object can be lit up in a giant thermonuclear furnace, a star like our own sun. Now imagine an object so large, filled with so much mass, that the cycle of pressure and gravity will keep increasing and compressing an object in a way that cannot be stopped. The end result is that all the mass will be compressed into a single point, infinitely small and of infinite density. This point is called a singularity. All the mass around it falls in, making it more massive, but no more large. Now then, the whole idea of general relativity started with the need to formulate how light can move through a gravitational field. And it was shown that gravity can bend light. It also means that light can fall into a gravitating black hole. But the gravity is so strong that light can't get out. There is a radial surface on the black hole above the singularity where you have to go the speed of light to get away from it. This is called the event horizon. Once you cross it, you're doomed to fall into the singularity. You can never get out. We've found black holes in the centers of every galaxy we've checked. They are out there, and if you ever get inside, you can never get out. Or maybe not. The black hole model I was presenting just now is the one most physicists accept today, the singular model. However, in my research, I came across a different idea. To begin with, you should know that the singular model has a problem. It's called the information paradox. There are a lot of equations to show that this is a problem, but one idea shows it best. Supposedly, a black hole will grow bigger when mass is thrown into it. The event horizon will thus take up more space. The information of the mass going into the black hole has to travel to the event horizon to tell it to get bigger. But the information can't do that because it has to move faster than the speed of light to get there. So how can anything cross the event horizon if information of its crossing can't get to the event horizon to make it bigger? That's the paradox. Scientists claim that it doesn't matter because you can definitely cross the event horizon. If you travel in a spaceship and accelerate to the speed of light, you'll experience a force, like gravity, and an event horizon will form behind you. Light under the event horizon can't reach you, just like a black hole. If you jump out of the ship, you will fall through the event horizon and you will feel weightless, just like a free fall. This implies that you can fall through a black hole's event horizon the same way. 
This claim, however, is patchy because as you can see, the coordinate system describing an accelerated object is not equivalent to the metric describing a gravitational field. Another solution may be needed. One of the solutions around this problem is the non-singular model of the black hole. In this model, nothing ever crosses the event horizon. The mass, and that means all of the mass, always stays outside. But how can that be? What keeps it from falling in? Well, as you'll recall, earlier I said that Einstein's gravity had to incorporate time as well as space. I also said that the metric was the central term of Einstein's field equations. Now we're going to apply that. Here is the previously shown metric called the Schwarzschild metric. It imagines a simple sphere that is not charged and not spinning, just sitting there. Note that the coordinates with the 2gm over r to c squared terms. These coordinates indicate the time dilation and the height contraction above the body. Now with this metric we can imagine compressing the gravitating body into a black hole. Once it's a black hole, we discover that as we go deeper and deeper into the field, time takes longer and longer to pass. At the same time, height becomes shorter and shorter. And then we get to the event horizon. Here we discover that time is now so long that it is infinite. Also, height is so short that it is non-existent. This means that according to the Schwarzschild metric, you cannot reach the event horizon. Physicists have made elaborate and complex math to try to explain away this problem, but in doing so, they run into the same information paradox that I talked about earlier. The fact is that the unaltered Schwarzschild metric of spherical gravity forbids you from crossing the event horizon. You can't go inside the black hole at all. But wait. If you can't go inside the black hole, then what is inside of it? It is a 3D volume, so there must be something in there. Well, no, perhaps not. Remember that we already know that the metric tensor must be made up of real numbers. Well, under the event horizon, numbers become imaginary. They all have little i in them. This means that space cannot be there. We have a case in which we must confront the idea that a black hole is really a hole. But don't get depressed about this idea. Instead, imagine this, an infinite piece of paper in all directions and you are on one side of it. Now poke a hole in it and you have access to the other side of the paper. Suppose you poke a hole somewhere else. Now you can imagine an ant crawling into one hole, disappearing, and then coming out through the other hole. The ant vanished in one place and reappeared somewhere else. This is the ability of poking holes in space-time. You can travel to distant places without anyone knowing how you got there, just like that ant. Einstein and his colleague Nathan Rosen had thought of such a proposal, but they knew they weren't dealing with small holes in flat paper. These were huge holes in curvy space-time, so they had to play by gravity's rules to define them. They did so in a paper called The Particle Problem in the General Theory of Relativity, published in 1935, a full 30 years after Einstein's paper on special relativity. First, they found that a small variation in the metric, given a collapsing gravity to a black hole, could force the tensor into a new type of space called a hypersurface. Then, substituting u squared equals r minus 2m into the metric, he produced a new gravitational field that was described by both positive and negative numbers. Positive above the event horizon and below would be negative. These two surfaces would be opposite in their curvature and because each coordinate corresponds to another coordinate with an opposite sign they would be in a way symmetrical. This is the idea of a wormhole. Since the Schwarzschild metric argues that black holes must be holes in space-time, then like holes, or tunnels, it may be said that they can go to very far off places not apparently connected. These are special types of wormholes, however. You can't travel through them. They are kept open by the mass around their event horizons, forcing them apart. The mass is the densest mass possible in the entire universe and shrouds the entire black hole. Even if you could get through the densest material in the universe, you would find yourself in a space-time that is inverted from normal space-time, with negative values of u. It would spit you right out, just as the side in our universe would pull you right in. This is called a white hole. All black holes in this model are really just black holes on this side, 
and on the other side, they're reversed. They are white holes. It's important to remember that there is just one side and another side. There is no inside. Remember, it's a hole. Okay, so for this conjecture or hypothesis to work, black holes are non-singular. They have white hole wormholes inside of them that you can't cross with any known technology. So what? What does that have to do with dark matter? Well, this is the jump the hypothesis must make. Remember that in relativity, gravity is not a force, but the expression of the curvature of space-time. According to Einstein and Rosen, the space-time can be made in such a way that a black hole can form a wormhole. Now ask yourself what would happen if the wormholes started connecting to one another? Or even if they were not connecting, if they are collecting because of the geodesics of space-time, what would we see? Would we not see clusters of ends of wormholes gathering together? Would we not see much more gravity induced by these wormholes by the increase of curvature and thus increased gravity caused by balancing with the negative values of U with the positive values? Well, that's exactly what we see. The phenomenon called dark matter appears to be associated with both galactic size and the size of the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. Here is a potential relationship with all of those factors. Galaxies may be forming clusters by their Einstein-Rosen bridges. Though invisible to us in our universe, their effect is apparent and creates a convergence of the behaviors of galaxies of the rotation and of their clustering with black hole centers. But how? What are the dynamics and the geometry of their interaction? I don't know because I'm not a physicist. That is research far beyond the scope of what I can do on my own. However, I am confident that the Einstein field equations elucidate everything on the subject of gravity. The first step is changing the accepted model of black holes from singular to non-singular. Then, perhaps the mystery of dark matter, and mysteries beyond, can be unraveled.